Uh, super. Uh, as I said, Mike, thanks uh, very much for the kind introduction and, and th thanks for the opportunity to, to speak. It's a, uh, it's a privilege and a pleasure to be able to stand up and say something in these, you know, sort of isolated times. Um, so what I've put together today is um, you know, somewhat tongue in cheek, um, modifying your modifying factors with the use of sensors. And I'll cover a couple of uh, things in terms of fu fundamental sensor principles, as well as applications either that I've been involved in or, or that I'm aware of where um, sensors can target specifically those um, you know, not knotty problems that whether we're consultants or operators uh, are faced with in terms of uh, ore loss and uh, and dilution. So um, I'll, I'll speak a little bit, just a, a quick slide on on sort of the definition of ore, um, you know, and what makes up ore, uh, and then just again concepts from a bit of an experience that I've had. Um, from resource and reserve audit days, actually, in terms of understanding real dynamics of all um, losses and, and and waste dilution, and an anecdote from uh, actually from sort of PhD days about taking measurements of dilution and what, and how they compare to people's expectation um, of, of their own levels of dilution. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the EM spectrum broadly and how sensors and and how they interact with matter sort of fits in with that um, and I want to go through sort of three key examples from my point of view of um, how one takes a sensor principle and applies it to a, a a real world situation that can either help us understand the the nature of an ore body better uh, better define the the physical extents of that ore body thicknesses uh, extent and, or, or the for instance the composition the content um, whether that's the or a waste, and I'll and I'll finish with a bit of a summary. So um, you know what is or, um, and I realise I probably put the bullet points the wrong way around because the the, the main point is um, I guess perennially the, the the thing that we're really interested in in the ore, um, where if this is a base metal situation like copper for instance, you know the stuff we're interested in is maybe 0.5 percent of the of the mass of the stuff we're we're digging out of the ground. In in other base metal situations, it could be, you know, a percent or five percent if it's lead or zinc. Um, but by by fraction, the mass of the stuff we're really interested in is is very very small. Um, but we define the mass of, of of all of that, the 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 lot, if you like, as as the ore, the the metal bearing rock that could be mined, uh, transported, processed, and sold as a profit. Um, not all, are, uh, not all ores are created equal. Um, you know that we, we have high grade ores and low grade ores, and everybody loves having a uh, having a high grade ore. Um, low grade ore, and this is where it gets very interesting. I mean, it's either 100% low grade ore. If you're in a disseminated ore body and you've got finely disseminated sulfides, and there's a low concentration of those, um, you know that that's a low grade ore. But in many instances, and this is this is where my particular experience. Um, yeah, has intersected. Um, Low-grade ore can actually be high-grade ore that's just highly diluted. And if if that's your situation, then you've got a whole, whole bunch of um, uh, different opportunities that are presented. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can use sensors to address that yeah. in, in the next couple of slides. So two two thoughts on on ore, on on waste, and and parameters around loss and dilution. On, on the left hand side is my sort of clever uh, reconciliation uh, schematic where, you know, and it's, this is a sort of open pity type um, uh, example. You have an ore bench, I guess a polygon in your in your mine plan. Um, and we know, uh, you know, as I said in the previous slide, ore is made up already of quite a large amount of internal dilution already included in the definition of ore. Um, and in our planning, we've we've said, well, you know, maybe five percent of the ore would get lost in in the process of of mining it. So we've got ore losses five percent, and and we might have some unplanned dilution that comes in um, five percent. So you've you've replaced five percent of the ore you've lost with five percent waste dilution. And then you know, when we come and do our resource and our reserve audits, it's, it's very interesting. You know, you've got your it's, quantum of ore at the beginning of the year, 
you've got known depletion because that's all very well surveyed the volume of stuff that's got mined and sent to the to the mill stockpile that's quite well defined and the grade is always well defined because it gets reconciled at the back end of the mill and then there's a volume of material that went to the waste pile and nine times out of ten those numbers don't add up and the, and the reality is because even though we've got reasonable good estimates of um, for instance, waste dilution in the ore or ore losses to the waste. There's a whole bunch of interacting factors happening during the mining where you no know, waste gets inadvertently mined as ore and reports to ore. Ore gets inadvertently mined as waste and sent to waste um, over and above the waste that's already included in the definition of ore and the ore losses that are already factored into your mine planning factors. So it, it's very, very complicated in reality. Um, especially when the extents and um, boundaries of the ore, as, as Gordon was saying earlier, like there are techniques to determine the, the, you know, the beginning and the end of things and the content in the middle. But when you're actually in the middle of mining it, it sometimes gets a bit confusing and people mine the wrong stuff um, and send the wrong stuff to the wrong places. And again, that, that it's, it's a problem, but it creates opportunity. On the right hand side here, um, this is a graph from uh, actually a bunch of case studies there's 60 case studies in this in this graph of mines that, that were surveyed uh, they were asked you know what were your modifying factors uh, this is more on the dilution side that's very hard to actually quantify loss um, this is like 60 mines in, in the weighted towards open pits um, you know what what are your what are your modifying factors dilution loss and typically the responses in the survey were between five and ten percent. Um, dilution were the, were the modifying factors used and these are actual samples that were taken of the mill feed uh, going to the mill and then dilution assessed in that um, in that mill feed and, and the values range so there the weren't anybody any of those numbers were in the 10 percent category um, the values measured range between 20 percent dilution uh, and you know almost 10 percent of the of, of the examples in that population of 60 had levels of dilution of 70 or 80 percent so um, the message there is your levels of dilution in practice can be way higher um, than the modifying factors that you, you've assumed it, either in your planning phase or your um, uh, or your mine operations phase. So just talk uh, very briefly about um, sensors in the electromagnetic spectrum um, without getting into too much detail. So to, to my mind, all, like all sensors are electromagnetic sensors whether it's the you know, CCD detectors that sit inside your digital camera, whether it's your electromagnetic sensors of the, the nature that uh, Gordon uh, was describing earlier, uh, whether we're talking about X-ray uh, detection or um, even gamma ray detection, they're all electromagnetic of some um, uh, order or the other. Um, most sensors, it, again, in sort of self-defined world, sensors are either of the source detector type where the incident energy is generated by the sensor and then the let's call it the fluorescent or the or the, the um, attenuant energy is is then recorded by the sensor some sensors and, and i'll like describe one example the energy just you know sort of comes from the environment it's cosmic energy or, or you know cosmic particles if you want to call them particles and then it's just, we're just using an electromagnetic detector to detect the energy levels or the attenuation of, the, of those energy levels. But at the end of the day, all sensors are electromagnetic and they exist somewhere on this on this spectrum. So, you know, when you're on the left hand side, you're in sort of cosmic ray world or, or gamma ray world when you're into truly ionizing uh, levels of energy, uh, cosmic rays and gamma rays ionize the nucleus and, and can displace protons and neutrons from the nucleus. And we get sort of characteristic responses from that. X-rays tend to ionize the outer shell electrons. Uh, and again, we get characteristic um, energies and, and responses from that. In the sort of, call it hyperspectral world, we're either exciting the outer electron bonds or just doing surface interactions that excite the atoms. Um, when we get to microwaves, we're actually um, inducing you know, rotation between polar bonds in either the molecules or the crystalline structure. And then on the extreme, you know, sort of long wave side in radio waves, we're passing our energy entirely through the matter and really just measuring the attenuation of the, of the waves themselves and not really measuring a, a, either a molecular or, a, or an atomic 
a reaction. So again, I, th I think the main point is all, all sensors are electromagnetic at some level of definition, and it's just how we understand the, firstly, the generation of the energy, and, and secondly, the, the attenuation of that energy in terms of the physical property that we're trying to measure. So my, my, my first of the three examples is hyperspectral imaging. Uh, there'll be many in the audience uh, today that know that better than know, know hyperspectral better than me, but um, I, I find it very interesting because it, uh, just really the range of applications of hyperspectral. Um, it, it's hyperspectral. I guess it used a couple of different terms people use for hyperspectral. Multispectral imaging, hyperspectral imaging um, can be used interchangeably. It's really down to the what, what, fundamentally it's the oversampling of the wavelengths to create additional information in the image. So you've got an image of a, of, a, of a flower or a rock or whatever, and you're looking at multiple wavelengths for every pixel to understand what information is behind the visible spectrum or the hypervisible spectrum that can tell you more about the, you know, the, the subject in, in essence. And it comes down to like levels of absorption or, or reflectance thereof. Um, the, the, the key here is hyperspectral gets used either at extreme long ranges uh, Landsat, which is the example that I have, um, but on the microscopic end, um, hyperspectral can also be used at the microscopic level also to determine the, the structural composition um, at that length scale as well. So very wide range of applications for this particular sensing technology. Um, so in exploration, we're using the natural absorption or reflection of the um, uh, light energy by the different minerals in the ground. Um, it, it's useful because it penetrates fauna and flora, much like LIDAR does. It's, it's not attenuated by uh, vegetation, but it is, at the end of the day, it's reflected by the rock substrates. And we get great information about what's in the ground or what might be in the ground or the surface expression of what might be in the ground essentially from the collection of absorption or reflection features that come at various different um, wavelengths in the in the light that comes back. So we can identify particular minerals um, and the structure of those minerals as they're expressed on the surface, essentially from space, which, uh, you know, I, I find that, I still find that quite amazing. Uh, the next example that I'd like to talk about is uh, muon detection. This is, this is less commercially available um, than hyperspectral imaging, but, uh, uh, you know, no less exciting. Um, and what it exploits or this this um, technology exploits is uh, not so much the cosmic rays, the pr primary cosmic rays um, interact with the ionosphere of the Earth, um, but there are daughter products of those uh, interactions in the ionosphere that create the muons that we can use in muon detection technology and they're essentially, they're, they behave a lot like electrons. They've got the same charge structure as electrons, but they have the mass of protons. So they're very high energy particles, very penetrating, not attenuated by any particular, um, you know, um, distance through matter, for instance. And, and that makes them very useful. So the muon detector um, very quickly is two semiconducting plates separated by a distance and uh, it, generally arranged in an array to create the imaging effect. So we have, you know, nine muon detectors in this particular plate, um, and the low energy muons are absorbed completely by the upper plate, but the higher energy muons are absorbed and detected on the second plate. And it's essentially the difference between the muon in incidence on the top plate to the bottom plate that tells you something about the things that the muons have passed through to get to you. And the reason why this is important is um, it can be used to image all bodies in the ground. So again, we it's, it's kind of cosmic X-ray, uh, even though it's sort of high energy than, than X-rays. It's, it's, it's kind of a cosmic X-ray where by passing a muon detector down the borehole, uh, because the muons are incident from essentially multiple angles, we can achieve quite a decent image of what's between the muon detector and the surface of the um, you know, the, the, the ground level um, and get relatively decent images of not just the thickness of what uh, and density of what sits between the muon detector and the um, incident um, muon rays, uh, but also the extents thereof. So used in conjunction with exploration boreholes, for instance, we get a much better idea, again, of continuity 
where boreholes are not that good, you know, drill hole assays and, you know, all body modeling is not so good at, uh, we, we make inferences about continuity, but we don't know. Um, by using muon detection in combination with um, the drill hole data, we can understand not just the continuity between boreholes, but extents e uh, of the ore body uh, even beyond boreholes, which is very useful then in uh, modeling and, and planning in next stages of design. Next technology, uh, very quickly, uh, laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy, um, high-power pulsed lasers, uh, relatively close range, sort of meter range now we're talking about, um, incidents on, on the substrate, on the mineral, the rock, creates a small bubble of plasma. It's a pulsed uh, laser, so the laser switches off and then the plasma bubble collapses. Um, and then what is, is emitted as the plasma bubble collapses is characteristic energy of the of the material itself that gets passed through a diffractometer, gets turned into a variety of wavelengths, um, and those wavelengths to then tell us something about what's in the um, in the sample that's been bombarded by the laser. The uh, spectral example that I've got in the in the in the in the plot here. This is a copper ore. It's a relatively low grade. Uh, copper ore pretty much only had copper in it and uh, light elements, and we've got two copper um, uh, spectral lines here at 325 and 327 nanometers. And again, the, the wavelength of the spike gives you the characteristic of the element. So we know that that's copper because it's at 325 nanometers, and the height of that peak gives us some indication of the concentration of the copper. So that gets that's quite useful in. Um, you know, doing um, you know analytical uh, assessment of a, a rock or a, or a stream of rocks passing the sensor. The application here is is really in mine planning, where you know traditionally we've just used the block model and planned our benches, drilled the benches, blasted the benches, and loaded the benches. Um, there are you know more advanced methods now where we use blast hole sampling uh, to take a sample of the drill cuttings as the blast hole drill is is doing its job. And that will give us a, you know, a total assay for the length of the of, of the blast hole. Maybe it's a 12 meter bench or a 15 meter bench. So we get one data point for 15 meter length of the blast hole using laser breakdown spectroscopy on the blast hole drill itself. So, you know, the chip, the blast hole cuttings are coming out of the top of the blast hole. We've got a LIBS device sitting in the top of that um, chute, measuring the grade of the material as it comes out of the blast hole. Um, chip shoot, and it gives us some idea of not just the grade of the entire hole, but what the grade is doing. This is an iron example. Uh, it gives you some idea of what the grade of the iron is doing, you know, on the full length down the hole. You know, this one, for instance, there's a small intersection at around about five meters of, you know, what would be low, below cutoff grade iron, and then you can quite clearly see at the bottom here, where there's a, you know, two meters of material at the bottom of the hole that's well below cutoff, and you know, you, you might want to um, take a different decision about whether you then, you know, blast the full length of the hole or, or how you would load that material once the uh, once the bench has been blasted. So a good example of how sensor picking can be used to adjust your mine planning uh, parameters. Uh, the last example is um, is high speed X-ray fluorescence. So again, we're, we're sort of in the in the ionizing um, energy range. We irradiate the mineral with um, X-rays uh, of a particular energy. It displaces outer shell electrons. So typically K and L shell electrons get displaced by X-rays. Um, and that doesn't create the characteristic energy. Other electrons come and, and essentially fall into the orbits to replace the electrons that have been um, displaced by the incident energy. And that's what creates uh, uh, the characteristic energy that gets measured by the um, X-ray detector. It's either a silicon pin or a silicon drift detector. And again, that measures both the characteristic energy of the emitted um, waves, so the photoelectrons, um, but also the number of photoelectrons that get emitted give you some idea of, of the concentration of, the, of that particular species of atom in, in the sample. So again, this is an iron example. We've got energy coming out of the atom at 6.7 kilo electron volts, and we've got a certain number of counts of those photoelectrons, so we get some idea that there's, you know, this is actually quite a high grade iron. This is, you know, sort of 60% iron um, in the in the sample. So that, you know, again, it's an analytical technique 
uh, very, very useful. Um, and, and here's a good application of, of high-speed X-ray fluorescence in the actual operation of the mine itself. So this is um, X-ray sensors integrated with the bucket of the shovel. This is an example at Highland Valley Copper uh, Tech, as Gordon will um, uh, attest from his presentation, are, are quite adoptive of uh, new and innovative technologies to add value. So um, th there are quite a few examples of these things that have been used at Tex Mines and Highland Valley uh, Copper is one of those. So here we've got X-ray sensors integrated with the bucket of the shovel. Um, the shovel's mining a waste bench, for instance. Um, when the sensors detect that the material is waste, it goes into the waste truck on the, le on the left-hand side here. But in certain instances, again, when you've got um, you know, or there's an ore uh, loss situation. The sensors might detect that that particular shovel bucket is is ore, and and there's a ore truck available for the shovel to load into, and then that can then go to the mill, um, and we can recover some value instead of sending it to the waste dump. So, in in this particular example, actually, the, the bit of an anecdote here, when 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 Highland Valley were f uh, first approached about this technology, um, and they were asked about dilution and loss, they they sort of anecdotally said, well none, zero, um, but we're convinced that, you know, they should have some parameters there. So they admitted to 5% dilution and 5% loss. Um, in the deployment of the technology, levels of 15% dilution and 10% loss were actually measured in practice. So again, an example of where sensors can be deployed, not just to reveal the evidence of dilution and loss, but maybe reveal that the levels of dilution and loss that are being experienced are, are, are higher than Maybe those that were assumed in the in the planning or the in the design or or, or the planning uh, phases. So a couple of thoughts in conclusion, uh, very very quickly. Um, the, there are tremendous you know and, and well developed usual practices for the discovery uh, of ore bodies and the estimation um, mineral resource estimation for those ore bodies and and fundamentally they either wrongly. Uh, estimate dilution and loss or, or, or vastly underestimate levels of dilution and loss. And, and again, from, from my particular experience, I think that's an opportunity. Um, sensors are available that can measure many parameters of, of, of materials, uh, particularly their composition and structure. And I think, you know, more and more we should use that and deploy that. Um, the, the interesting application of sensors is that they're not particularly more, let's say, precise or accurate than samples and assays. But because they tend to measure larger volumes of stuff, they're more re representative than they say than say more traditional uh, methods of, of, of drill hole assays, composites, samples, uh, those kind of things. So need to be used in, in complement essentially to to give a better understanding. Um, definitely sensors, at least you know I think maybe in my lifetime are not going to be admissible for mineral resource estimation or reporting, but they're certainly very, very good for planning and, and management of operations and improvements of efficiencies. Uh, intelligent deployment of sensors can limit dilution, which, you know, at the end of the day saves you money because you don't put that stuff through the mill um, or avoid loss. Uh, so thereby creating value uh, material that you would have sent to the waste pile can get recovered or left in the ground actually can get recovered and, and sent to the mill in and ideally makes a profit, especially when metal prices are high. So um, uh, I think that's the end. Uh, Mike, thanks very much for the uh, opportunity to speak and I I'd be very happy to, to take some questions.